Um, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Uh, I, I think before we pray, I think I'll give you a hint of where I'm going because I'm sure I'll get lost. And I don't want you to get lost. So I think one of the things you want to keep on your mind that you want to already understand is that we're in a great warfare. That great warfare is defined as the good fight, the good fight of faith. And in that warfare, there is a, that we need a foundational, we need a base, a home base, an infrastructure, something that is strong like you would see in any war. And then we need a weapon, at least one or two good weapons. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And then we're going to end with John the Baptist being kind of a good example for us, but not as good as what we really are in Christ. And, uh, but he was great. I mean, yet not as great as you are as a church in union with Christ, gifted to do the uh, great warfare we had before us. The good, the good fight of faith. And so, um, I don't know about you, but a good fight is better than a bad fight. And a good fight is exciting. And uh, we have God in our corner. And we are already, before entering the battle, more than conquerors. I think we need that. We need to remember that as a church. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for everything you do in our lives. We know that everything that comes across our lives as Christians, we know whether they're bad, whether they're fatal, or whether they're destructive, or whether they're just great, wonderful blessings that you give us with. All of them are good in your sight, and for your glory, and for our joy. And so, Lord, as we look at this great, this good fight of faith, as we pause for a moment and begin to think about the the adversity and the difficulties in our own personal lives, in our family lives, with our children, our grandchildren. And when we look at the family and we look at the community and we look at the country and all of those things that seem at times to be shattering around us, help us to understand, Lord, that you got this. And because you got it, we got it. And so we just pray that's the kind of spirit we have one with great strength, tenacity, in the faith we have in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I only put in the bulletin three questions because I've never been able to stay with an outline very well, so that won't work. But these questions I would like you to think about before I start. Uh, I kind of rephrased them a little bit, but I'm going to go by the one in the bulletin and tweak it a little later, but here are three questions I want you to think about. Questions you already think about. These are personal, these are national, these are world, these are global. That's a, I don't care what is in your mind, I just want you to put it in your mind. I want you to refer or bring it up to your mind. What are the greatest challenges you're in your heart this week? What are the greatest challenges? What are the greatest fears? What are the greatest problems? What are the greatest stresses? that you're facing this week. Could be family, could be national, could be global, could be local, it could be in your church. What are the greatest stresses that you face this week? And then <clears throat> what is or are the most effective solutions for these challenges? Now that may sound as different for each of you, right? Because the problem might be different. Like you might, you might have a broken leg. You think, well, the solution is go to a doctor and get the leg mended, right? That may be true. And that is true. That is true. You can go to a doctor. That is not the solution. We need to keep our minds on what the real solution is, lest we get caught up with all the little solutions. We are the body of Christ. What does that mean? Every person in this room that knows the Lord is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Every person in this room is gifted by the Holy Spirit. You corporately are in union with Christ because of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? 
And God is the head of your church, Christ Jesus. He's the head. So I guess I could ask you the question whether you would want the, some president of the United States to be your head or Christ, and which one would you choose? And which one would have the most power? I think we need a little shot in the arm to decide who we are and who we represent. So those questions are, I know, uh, you know, Lynn was up here and he, he showed some chagrin about some things that are happening in this world. And I'm wondering if you already knew that you were more than a conqueror, what is it that could possibly bother you? and cause you to shy away from the, from the uh, war. The good fight of faith. So, so let's begin with this. R.C. Sproul was asked a question. I know you know R.C. Sproul because I never knew him until John Sturck introduced me. So whatever you think about R.C. Sproul now, just remember I learned about R.C. Sproul from your pastor. In fact, he had a whole series of films here, probably 30 years ago with R.C. Sproul going through theology. And R.C. Sproul was asked this question, what is it that the world needs most today? And R.C. Sproul said, they need to know God. Then they asked him another question, what is it that the church needs most today? And R.C. Sproul said, they need to know God. All right, I think most of us agree with that. The church needs to know God. They need to know God. The church is in a glorious warfare. I don't know how to explain that. I mean, you never think of a warfare as glorious. Unless, of course, you already have the victory. And you know you have the victory. Doesn't mean you're not gonna suffer or get bruised up a little bit or even die. But as a church, you already have the victory. The church is a glorious warfare. Glorious because only the church can fight the good fight of faith. The Apostle Paul said, I have fought the good fight of faith. You know the biography of Paul, right? You know in, this, uh, in, in what, 60 AD? Peter and Paul, in that decade, were both martyred. And that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. And yet he's more than a conqueror and he calls it, I have fought the good fight of faith. This is the challenge this morning that I want to bring to you. What is the foundation? What is our military base? What is our infrastructure that we stand upon when we go to battle? And what is the greatest weapon that we have? Now, there are a lot of weapons we have by the means of grace that God gives us. Prayer being one of them, reading the word of God, coming together and fellowshipping. But I'll just tell you right up front, the greatest weapon that we have is the gospel. It is the gospel. And we need to know that. Well, we all know, we've all been told, well, you need to get out and pass out a few tracts and meet some people and tell them about Jesus. And you do that. Okay, I'm going to go tell people about Jesus. Knock on a door at night. The doors I've knocked on, unbelievable. What comes to the door is scary anymore. I don't even tell you what comes to the door when I'm knocked on doors. And we kind of get a little guilt complex. Feel like, boy, I need to get out and start witnessing. I had a person, I, I gave this message uh, a couple weeks ago, I guess, a month ago, two months, I don't know, lost track of time. And a uh, person came up afterwards and says, yeah, I just wish I could get with it and start witnessing. I said, you know, it's not like that. It's not like that. When we know God and who he is, and of course that doesn't, that's not just a one-time thing. Your witness is spontaneous. Our witness is spontaneous. See, well, it's not spontaneous for me. Well, there's a solution to that. Know God. Know God. Now, I want to talk a little bit about war. The only, I was in the Navy, but the only war I really kind of have fun with, it's just fun, is chess. I love playing chess and 
How many chess players do we have in here? Good. I challenge you. As one chess player to another, the rest of you have no clue what we're talking about. You have no idea that you can actually play chess and your heart rate will go up to 120. You have, it's a war. It's black and white. White moves first. So it's understood that white is always on the offensive when it starts. Black plays defensive. Of course, the rule is always be as, think defensive before you think offensive. When I play black, I usually lose because I never get off the defensive. I'm always defending, I'm setting up my pieces, I'm protecting them, I'm making me a castle. And I never attack anybody. We, we're the ones on the offense here. In this world, in our neighborhood, we are the ones on the offense because we are already declared more than conquerors. More than conquerors. So, John Sturck called me 25 years ago on the phone. Called me many times. On that day, he called me and says, guess what I'm preaching on? Hmm, preaching on the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Just tell me. And he says it with his voice. Hope you're listening, John. The aseity, the aseity of God. You guys remember that message, don't you? The aseity of God. A-S-E-I-T-Y. Okay, the look you have on your face is the same look I had on the phone. The aseity of God. I said, what's that? And so, what I want to do, there's many attributes of God. You can get any book on attributes. Well, God is never broken or divided. But the aseity of God captured my attention in this message as a foundation or a home base that we can just think on for a moment to encourage us and understand who we are in this war, in this, in this uh, faith, this good fight of faith. So anyway, aseity, you spell A-S-E-I-T-Y, and it starts with the word, the letter A, which is a Latin prefix that means that means um, from. It means from. That's good. And then say means or means self. So the aseity of God simply means from self. And you say, and I've got to get through this quickly because there's some good stuff I want to hit with it, but I want you to get this aseity. This is your base. This is your foundation that I want you to have today. This is when you're looking at the world falling apart and you know, rain's coming down and everything's falling apart, you know, there's fire coming out of the sky and we're starting to die. Well, this is not time for Christians to retreat. We have a good fight of faith. And so let's take a look at what a aseity is. From self kind of gives you an idea. Knowing about a aseity of God supports the church in her glorious fight to apply the divine solution to the problems that we have around us, to our fears and our problems and our concerns. Know the aseity of God. Okay, listen, you're still looking at me funny when I say that word. Okay, E-I makes the A sound like an eight. So I want you all to repeat, aseity, ready? One, two, three. Aseity. Did you hear that, John? Hmm? Where's the camera? Did you hear that? They all said aseity. All right, so let's talk about it. Here's some, here's some verses that support the aseity, or from self. And let's just do this quickly. For uh, the first encounter of aseity is Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Simply this. Before the beginning, God was. He's altogether different than us. The God is in our corner. That is the foundation of our lives and the ministry that he has sent us to do he is the very foundation and he is before all things and he's beyond our comprehension. We will have eternity to understand God. In the beginning, and then in John 1, 4, we see the second person of the Trinity coming into this as well as the Holy Spirit. Speaking of the ministry of God, the word which became flesh in John chapter 1, 1 to 4. Be encouraged by these words. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. 
The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. All things were made came from God. All things made came from God. From God. All things made, good or bad. Anything that's around you, made by God. And without him, nothing. And no one came into existence. You didn't come into existence. No potentate in this world came into existence without God. God alone. Life came from the triune God alone. There is no life in all creation without God. Light comes from God. God is light. God brings light into the world. That's the victory that we proclaim. Here's another support in Colossians 1, 16 and 19. Be encouraged again by these words. They're, long, they're not really long passages, but follow them. They're, fa- they're passages you're familiar with. You know them. But think of them in terms of your home base, your foundation, and the good fight of faith. This is God, the God that you need to know, that you need to continue to know. Or, or we fail in our battles. <laughs> we have to encourage people in this. Colossians 1, 16 and 19, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible or invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things are held together or consist. And he is the head of the body, the church. This is your sovereign king, the Lord Jesus Christ, where you come from him and fight the good fight of faith, the fight that you already have victory in. And he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all the fullness dwell. Say it, he applies to the second person of the Trinity. Jesus is the preeminent one. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the light of the world, and from him alone all things consist and are held together from him, from self, according to his will alone. Then Romans 11, another passage that you're all familiar with, but, but there are passages that I love reading over and over again, and I hope you're encouraged by it as well. To embrace this truth that you've always known. That we, have, we always have to come back and revisit this truth as a church. Always. Otherwise we get out of here and we start getting droopy mouthed and crying and all that stuff. And look, there's nothing wrong with crying. There's things to weep about out here, that's for sure. But we don't weep without standing up with a good fight of faith. That weeping causes us to fight the good fight of faith. Romans 11, 33 to 36, Oh, the depth and riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his way past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed to him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Those verses remind us of the aseity of God. This is what we stand on. This is our platform. This is where we launch out in the good fight of faith from this platform, from this foundation. This is our God. Just a list of things that this aseity means quickly here. God has always been and will always be. Nothing God created possesses self-existence. No created being can sustain itself. God is the uncaused first cause. God is not dependent on something outside of himself. He is life. He possesses life. And he alone gives life. Jesus said, I am that I am. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection. All that God needs is within himself. There is nothing in all his creation. There's nothing in all his creation that he needs. He's Trinity from eternity past. 
He has all the fellowship and all the love and all the joy that he needs. He creates us not so he might have more joy. He creates us so that we might enjoy him. <laughs> if only the world knew that. Why did God do all this? So you could have joy. So you could have strength, hope, and love. That's why. That's why God's a jealous God. He doesn't like it when you're pulled away to something else. Because he knows that will not bring you joy. There's a corollary to this or a consequence to these statements. Everyone and everything depends on God. Everyone and everything created pull this way, does not come into existence by his own power. Everyone and everything created does not proceed from itself. Nothing created exists in itself. God alone is the one who purposes and plans all things. So why is the safety of God important to resolve the fear problems and adversity and stresses that we face together? Today or any day in his, today or any day or in the history of the church, why is the Seity important? The Seity of God gives us the background, the foundation to confidently embrace and win the good fight of faith and realize before the battle even begins that we are more than conquerors. That's how we go out this door. That's how we face all these things. You think? Is there anything that's happening in this world, whether it be this country or this state or the globe, that God has not designed for a purpose, for his purpose? Do we think that God is out of control? That he's like some of the, uh, uh, the uh, new theology coming out where God is learning. Oh, I didn't know that was gonna happen. Oh, let's redo our plan a little bit. That was really got me off guard. Nothing gets your God off guard, ever. You say, well, wait a minute, I got some serious things happening in my family. Of course you do. We all do. We live in a groaning world, but we are victorious in those things. We have to believe that. Or I don't know whether it matters whether we give the gospel or not. And I don't think we'd give it spontaneously unless we do believe it. I want to read another passage in Romans. to bring this home. If God be for us, who can be against us? What's the answer to that? No one. No one. Okay, a little bit of an attitude. If God be for us, who can be against us? No one. That's eh, not bad. No one. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we he not with him also freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? No one. No one. No one. Well, why is that? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even on the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So you could say a lot about that. But I'm basically, this portion of the sermon is just to remind us, each of us, that when we go on this battle out here, it's a good fight of faith. We're already the winners. We already win. Perhaps we have to redefine what it means to win. What are we trying to win? Sometimes we're a little distracted by what the world thinks is victory. That's not where we're at. We'll be discouraged every time we do take the world's the definition of what it means to win. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril of sword? As it is written, for, my, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, no. It's really nay in the King James. Gave the McLean translation. No, no, no. My emphasis. No, 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 in all these things, 
We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yet, let's switch. Oh, what time is it? What is my time frame? We got a time budget. That clock there is always the same time to my eyes. It never moves. It doesn't. It was the same time that time I looked up. I've got to, I've got to tell this illustration anyway. Just to bring that home before we get into the, a little bit of negative statement, I want, you to, I want each of us to be challenged by. Um, have, you ever, you probably, have you ever seen that YouTube of the baby cub bear running from a lion? No? You guys are not YouTube watchers. Well, I want, you, I want you to take this baby cub bear, and, and that's kind of like you. And this baby cub bear is out in this beautiful pasture area behind a rock, and this deadly mountain lion who's filmed in this YouTube to look like he's twice the size of this, more than twice the size of this baby cub bear. And so this lion sees that cub and starts running after it, and the bear, little bear looks over the rock, ah! and they use little children's sounds for the bear to get you to have a little bit of human emotion, ah! and so he starts running, <laughs> and the lion comes after him, boom, 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 <laughs> and then he gets on a little limb that goes over a creek, he goes up the limb, it's leaning right over the creek, and the lion goes right over it too, goes chasing that little cub bear, and then the little cub bear gets on the little side of the limb and the limb breaks and the bear is now in the water, the rushing creek and the lion steps off and gets on the shore and follows the bear as he's running, the little bear as he's being run down the ocean and the bear swims to the side and grabs a rock but the lion steps on the rock and growls at him and then he pushes away from it and goes to another rock and finally he's on a rock and the bear and the, and the lion has him cornered. He's going, and finally the bear, the little cub bear, out of desperation, finally growls out with all the, rawr, 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 as loud as he could. And pretty soon the lion just backed off. And the little cub bear goes, rawr, 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 rawr. And then the camera focuses out, and there's a great big giant Kodiak bear mama standing behind him. That's the foundation. That's what we have. Yeah, we have. We're in the battle. Good fight of faith. We're like that little cub bear. But we got that big, giant, Kodiak bear, mom. Just looks and takes care of the adversity. Now we got to know that. That bear, by the way, got beat up a little bit. Got scratched in the face a couple times. So, Yet, in the light of aseity, we have a problem. And I, and I probably share this with you anytime I'm here, I share this verse with you, because Ken gave it to me, and I gave it to others. And it's Jeremiah 2, 12 to 13, as we think about the aseity of God and all that God is for us in Christ Jesus. We have to stop and be astonished, like it was in Jeremiah of God's people. And here's how it goes in Jeremiah chapter 2, 12 to 13, a warning to us. Be astonished, church, I'll say church. Here it says, be astonished, O ye heavens, of this, and be horribly afraid. Be desolate, saith the Lord, for my people. For my people have committed two evils. This is the sin under all sinning that I'm reading to you right now. You want to sin less? then take heed of this passage. For my people have committed two evils. They have, one, forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And two, have hewed out to themselves broken cisterns that can hold no water. God is the fountain of living water in the times of the church. And the church is in danger of trusting in broken cisterns. There's enough age in this room right now. 
I'm not the oldest yet, but I'm getting there. That means some of you are going to be checking out if I'm going to catch up. How many of you ever had cisterns on your farm or you've ever seen a cistern? All right, that sounds, yeah. You're only a couple of years, you're only three years older than me, though, aren't you? You're not even older than me. You're a young guy. Huh? How old? You said you're 27? Oh, man, you have been preserved very well. I look older than you. Okay, fine. That's all right. I'm good. I don't mind that. It's good. So um, now we're going to look at the, the, the weapon we have. And I'm, this is the body of it. Won't take as long, but it's most important. So what is the nature of our weapon, the gospel? that gives unquenchable hope in the face of impossible adversity. You see, that's really all we have to give to ourselves for our own strength, because the gospel is for the believer in the church. If you're anything like me, I was brought up in a church where the gospel is only for those guys we drug in and gave them the gospel so they get justified. And that's been one of our greatest weaknesses. If we walk out of here today thinking that the gospel is not for the believer, we're in trouble. Because that's where our fuel is. That's where our strength is. That's where our transformation takes place. That's how we get sanctified. So the gospel is the glorious, first of all, the gospel is a glorious proclamation. Gospel just means that. That's all it means. It means to proclaim. Proclaim from the housetops. Proclaim from the mountaintops. In fact, I want you to relate this, friend. Don't be intimidated. I'm going to read this to you. I want you to see a proclamation. I want you to just kind of get a, a feel for what it means to proclaim the gospel from these angels on the night Jesus was born. Now, don't be intimidated by these angels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Angel means messenger. But we are ambassadors of the living God. We are. You are ambassadors the living God. And you have within you the Holy Spirit that gives you the capability of proclaiming the gospel within that own proclamation. There is transformation that takes place with people around you in your own life. Now look what happened to the shepherds when they hear this. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring to you good news. That's what gospel means. Of great joy. That will be for all people. Now, I want you to notice the positive nature of their message. It's good news. Great joy for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly Hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest on earth, priest among those with whom he is pleased. So you got the idea here? Maybe next time you have an opportunity to give the gospel to somebody, maybe you should just recognize it hasn't anything, anything to do with your persuasive ability. It's not your persuasion. It's not even your knowledge, really, not in your head. It's what's in your heart that you transfer to one another when you congregate like this and encourage each other. It's in your heart. And when you proclaim the gospel, you are as just fantastic and spectacular and glorious as these angels are on that night. You say, well, uh, it doesn't seem that way. Well, that's fine. It's okay if it doesn't seem that way, as long as you understand it is that way. The gospel is a proclamation, a wonderful proclamation. Don't ever hesitate. Well, I don't want to put you in a situation, well, I, I hesitate too much. The main thing is to know God. And as you know God, and you're in a church, you get a good dose of God. And know God. Go in your devotions. When you read the devotions, it's not just one chapter a day. It may be one chapter a day, but it's read so you absorb it and you're looking for God. Doesn't hurt to have a little systematic theology. Doesn't hurt to have a little bit of that. 
So that when you look at a passage and you look at the narrative and you see the story, ah, oh, that's what we're saying about God. This is God being portrayed to me. This is God. I can see God in action, in the drama, in the human drama of history. So that is what empowers us to proclaim him. Spontaneously. I can remember, you know, and, and I have that go up and down with me. Sometimes I'm spontaneous and sometimes I'm not. And, and it's all related to knowing God. It's all related to my church and coming together in a body of people who are, who are, who are suffering by God's plan so that we might grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come together and rejoice in God and all that he is. And so, first, the proclamation is glorious proclamation. The gospel is. And then the gospel is power. The gospel is power. I'll quote this. You tell me what the next word is. You say you don't know what verse it is. Yeah, you will. Maybe not. Just in case. Paul says, I'll say in Romans, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You just got done with Romans. Everybody's got this memorized. Well, we got done with it several months ago, right? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the... Hey, good job. You taught them that. Power. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So right away, this glory is, is it simple to just simply say that, that the gospel is the power. It is the power. So it's important for us to get a hold of this foundation, whether it be a saity or omniscience or the other alms, what are they, omniscience, omnipresent, and um, Very good, thank you. You guys are really up. But get a hold of that and let that lift you up so that when you see a situation, you won't be able to keep your mouth shut. That's exactly the way Peter was. That's the way Paul was. Why? Because they know God. That's the most important thing for the church to know. To know God. Not just here, but here. So it causes the full trinity to radiate from your heart. Knowing God. Encourage each other in that. So it is power. And then the third one. The gospel brings forth glorious grace. Now let me read Romans 5, 6 to you, and I want you to picture yourself, I want you to picture yourself now even, and I want you to picture yourself before you're saved, and I want you to picture your friend, loved one, when you hear this voice. And this is good news, this is good news in this verse. For when we were yet without strength, when we had no strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now we have the flesh. All of our sins are completely forgiven because Jesus Christ paid the debt in full. It's impossible for that debt never to be paid for those who are in Christ because it is the very Son of God who shed his blood for us. And although he is the radiance of God, he is also the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And although he is the I am that I am, he is the one who did not come to be served but to serve. This is the Lamb of God. Paid for your sin. Ungodly people. He didn't, come for the un he didn't come for the godly. He didn't come for those who are well. He came for those who are sick, who need a physician. The gospel of glorious grace is for the ungodly who are without strength. It's the good news that does not ask anything from you because you don't have any strength. So you don't have anything to give. It's a gift. It has to be a gift. It has to be a gift. I got two stories here. I'm gonna give you a quick one because it's necessary for the second one. C.H. Persian told this story about a lady in the church who had no money, 
broke and couldn't pay the rent. And so the pastor went over to their house some Tuesday afternoon, knocked on the door several times, and no one answered the door. And uh, he went back to church. He, he saw the lady there and said, hey, I came by to see you this Tuesday. Oh, sir, what time did you come by? Well, I came by at 12 o'clock. Oh, I heard you knocking. I heard you knocking. But I didn't come to the door because I thought you came to collect the rent. No, the church took an offering. And we have a lifetime gift for you that we will always pay for your rent. You said, what does that got to do with the gospel? That's exactly what we do. We come to him without strength, ungodly, and he takes care of what we cannot take care of. Sometimes we make a mistake in our own sanctification that we think, whoa, now I'm on my feet. I can go, go, go. No, we still have to revisit the gospel, not for justification, but in our sanctification. Well, the second story is connected, and then this is rather emotional, so I'm going to try and be real careful to keep my composure. So uh, a couple months ago, my brother died. 79, almost 80, six years older than me. I had given him the gospel throughout the years. And it didn't ever really take as far as I knew, but we know it does take. But far as I could tell, boy, he was still cussing me up one side and down the other. He's a wonderful brother. He'd give the shirt off his back. But he was a little rough around the edges. And I visited him so often in the years that he was sick. And then I, I was teaching a Sunday school, and so I wasn't able to leave soon enough to see him in his last days. Prior to a phone call I had with him on his day before he died, about a couple years before, I was trying to tell him that the church is filled with sinners. He got all disturbed to my surprise. Filled with sinners? How can that be? How could they be filled with sinners? Well, he knew I was a sinner because I was his brother. <laughs> but he didn't think everybody else was a sinner. And he got so frustrated, he just yelled at me. What are you talking about? What? Like many people out here, they think we're nothing but moralists. That's what they think. Somehow we've transferred that to them without showing how our need for grace in the gospel is so important. So on his last day, I had nothing but a few moments. I got him on Zoom. He was in the hospital. And I told him these words. God did not send his son into the world to take anything from you. He did not come to condemn you, but he came to give you a gift of eternal life. And the reason, brother, why that must be so is because you can't do anything. That you're without strength. Well, he was a tough guy. And he probably didn't see himself without strength until those last moments. And he said, and I told him about the thief on the cross, I said, you don't have to be a theologian. You just have to know that you're a sinner and you need Jesus to save you. And only he can save you because he died for your sins and died in your place because he's God. And that's what the thief on the cross did. He didn't know, he wasn't a big theologian, he was just a person like you who was lost and saw he had no strength in himself and could do nothing and saw God who came to do everything. Then he said these words. That's why he did it. 
because I couldn't. I prayed for him for months, years. I really do believe at that moment God took him in his presence. Because out of that sentence he said, I can't do it. Only Jesus can do it. And that's why he did it. I think I'm going to leave it with that. Next time John calls me, I'll do the John the Baptist thing. It's only when my son Ken's not available. <laughs> but I do want to have some closing words with you. Let's see if we as a church cannot be spontaneous in giving the gospel. Not out of guilt, not out of somebody saying, well, you need to be giving the gospel more. Did you pass out five tracks? No. No. Come together as you are, the body of Christ, and dwell by the Spirit, gifted in all your ways that God gave you. Come together and know God. Know God not just here. We can spell a saying. We can talk about a saying. But is there a place in our hearts that says, God's got this. He's got this. And when we go out of here and we see the political climate, that should not be anything to us in the, other than that we pray for the country. That's not our main deal. Whether we were living in a communist country or a capitalistic free enterprise country like our own, our mission is exactly the same. We want to lift up the name of Jesus who has come to give a gift not to take anything away. He's come to pay the rent for those who can't pay the rent, which brings out of us a great compassion because that's exactly the way we were when God saved us. That's exactly the way we were. We're only like Vance Havner said, we're one beggar bringing, bringing food to another beggar. That's all we're doing, whether you're in communist China or democracy, republic of the United States. That's the way we are. So that's my prayer, that somehow as we look at these great, wonderful sermons that your pastor gives so faithfully, especially when it comes to who God is, that by the Spirit, it will go from here to here, both of them engage with such glory that we can't help but say, hey, from the housetops, come and hear the good news. The God-man, Jesus Christ, came not to take anything from you, but to give you a gift. He came to pay all of your debt that you cannot pay for yourself. That was in our hearts. Our proclamation would be grand, and the power would be settled, because the scripture says the gospel is and the grace would flow out of our hearts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for your word. We're thankful, God, that you've revealed yourself to us. And yet, Lord, we know, we know we have a tendency to turn away and drink out of broken cisterns. We all do. We all do, Lord. And we ask that you would sustain us, hold us together, bring us together, not just as individuals, each indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but as a body, of Christians coming together in union in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit that we might rise up Lord and fight fight the good fight of faith in Jesus name Amen